Support comes from BECU, a member-owned credit union putting people over profit, offering financial services and support to the community with access to local financial centers, over 30,000 ATMs, and online resources at BECU.org. Federally insured by NCUA. Hey, good morning. It's Paige Browning in for Patricia Murphy. It's Monday. This is Seattle Now. We all see the news stories and experience the smoke of wildfires up and down the West Coast. But what does it actually look like on the ground for the people who fight those blazes? On today's episode, we meet firefighters on the front lines and experience what it takes to put out a wildfire. But first, let's get you caught up. The chemical fire that sparked in a Puyallup warehouse on Saturday is still active and could burn for another day or more. There's still no word on what caused the fire, which tore through Washington cold storage. Parts of the building were left to burn, so the chemicals there would evaporate to avoid letting them smoke through the community. About 10,000 people near the site got reverse 911 calls telling them to evacuate over the weekend. They're now being told the shelter in place. Time to freshen up your face mask collection. Washington's mask mandate restarts today. By order from the governor, all people older than five must wear a face covering while in indoor public spaces. That includes at your gym, your bookstore, drag shows, any late summer weddings, etc. There are some exceptions for small offices and small indoor events. And remember, it still goes over both your mouth and your nose. And we have a seal pup update. Wildlife watchers in West Seattle have found the first harbor seal pup of this pupping season. The little one's been resting among driftwood. So if you're not looking closely, you might miss it along the beach. And that's a reminder for pet owners. Dogs off leash will be able to sniff out young harbor seals, even if the owner doesn't see them. And it can be dangerous or deadly for the seal pups. So keep Fido leashed on the beach. On July 13th, firefighter John Riley was just getting home after a long workday for the Chelan County Fire District. And the first thing in my Facebook feed is someone streaming a live video of a fire in monitor. John's heart sank to the floor. John knew the area where the fire had started. It's steep terrain with a lot of dry, light grass to quickly fuel a fire. So I've been in my house for about three minutes. Yeah, you finished a full work day. I, I get out, jump back in the truck, and start heading back down to Wenatchee. Um, and now I'm not going to admit how fast I was driving. Uh, we, we won't, we won't I was that. trying to get here. John had to actually pass by the fire on his way into the fire station. He saw people with their phones out filming. The fire was burning the hillside behind the Hot Rod Cafe close to town. John is describing to me what happened that first night of the fire as we're standing outside that cafe. Looking at the scorched earth behind us, I can see how close the fire came to the buildings around us. Oh, I see a house right there. Absolutely. Like, I mean... The, the fire at the base of that hillside in the wind with those fuels on that topography is going to be at that doorstep in a matter of minutes. Mm-hmm. Okay, it's, so we can't necessarily even hike up that hillside as fast as the fire can move. And I'm watching mm-hmm. it move, so now the accelerator is pushing down a little bit more and I'm get, trying to get to the station. <laughs> It was the beginning of what would become known as the Red Apple Fire, named after the street behind the cafe where the fire is believed to have started. We are following breaking news this morning out of Chelan County, a wildfire growing quickly, threatening homes and businesses, forcing people to evacuate. The concern is that it is very dry. There's a lot of fuel out there, a lot of brush, I should say, that can make this fire grow even larger. The fire lasted for about five days and burnt over 12,000 acres. I've come to Wenatchee because I want to know what it takes to put out a fire this big. What does that actually look like on the ground? We have an update now about that fire burning in Chelan County. Level 3, 2, and 1 evacuation notices in place for residents and nearby residents. As John Riley was speeding into the station, Deputy Chief Kelly Lindemann was already there. He took the first call that the fire was spreading. And while we talked, he says, right now it's about one acre, and he says... Now it's five acres. And, uh, so As you're I, on the phone. I was heading for the rig knowing that we were going to be going. I went and looked out the window and thought, oh, yeah, we're, we're definitely going to this. 
Whatever sparked this fire happened right on the edge of town. Homes have been built on steep terrain right up against the sagebrush and grasslands. John eventually joined Kelly at the station. They both headed out to provide protection to these homes as the fire rushed forward. The clock is ticking down. The mm-hmm. fires were watching the fire burn over a ridge and we're seeing by that point on West Eagle Rock, the sky is dark with smoke. There's an orange hue just behind all the ridges and you see the orange hue get brighter and dimmer as the fire uh, uh-huh. burns through denser fuels. And at the same time that John and Kelly were getting into position to defend homes, other agencies started directing firefighters into the field. The Bureau of Land Management, National Forest Service, and Washington State's Department of Natural Resources sent in crews to redirect the fire away from residential areas. Nolan Brewer is with DNR. Nolan drove up to a high ridge to get a view of the fire burning in the valley below. That vantage point allowed him to find natural features or old containment lines from past fires that crews on the ground could use to stop the flames from moving into an undesirable area. Okay, where's the footprint of this fire going to be? Like, if I draw a blob on my map, where am I going to catch this fire? Nolan helped direct where to cut fire lines in the dirt or dig up vegetation to create barriers around the fire. This can also be done by dropping water or fire retardant from aircraft. The strategy is the fire can't continue on if it doesn't have any fuel to burn. Essentially, they are painting a box. You see where you don't want it to spread, and you're painting a box with retardant, with water. And and you're using roads, ridge lines, old dozer lines, things that you know have the highest probability of success of catching that fire, Mm -hmm. right? That first night, Nolan knew that if they could contain the fire on the west side of a particular canyon, they could keep most of the houses out of danger. But with the wind that we had that night, it was kind of going to be like right there as to whether or not the retardant was going to hold or not. Um, and I, sure enough, as I'm watching the crews try to get in and engage this thing and just where the dozer is, I'm not feeling super optimistic about it, and and I'm watching that fire, and all of a sudden it pooches through, and I see the flames get brighter, and and then I hear the call on the radio of like, yeah, we're we're through the retardant line at this point, you know, and it's burning down into Warm Springs Canyon now. Not great news for John and Kelly, the two Chelan firefighters assigned to protect homes in that neighborhood. The Chelan County Fire District is only staffed up enough to fight one house fire at a time. But during the fight against the Red Apple Fire, they needed to defend over 250 homes. They had help and support from other districts, but resources were limited and they could only do so much. And those aircraft trying to box in the fire and keep it contained, they can only operate during the day. On that first night of the fire, Kelly remembers watching the sun go down and the airplanes leaving with it. All of a sudden, they all just flew off into the sunset. That was a daunting time just because you now, you know the rest of the evening is is on us. I want to see the work that John and Kelly were doing firsthand. So we drive up to the end of a cul-de-sac in the neighborhood they'd been protecting. Both sides of the valley in front of us are scorched black. The remains of the fire go all the way up to the ridge above us. It's a shocking view, a scar on the landscape. Trees and shrubs just a foot or so away from homes are fried. A white vinyl fence is charred and lays melted on the ground. I realize just how close some homes came to disaster. John tells me what it looked like that first night and we're watching Mm. the smoke rise and you can see the the fire growing because of the the orange hues in the sky, right? And it's becoming darker and night falls upon us. It is windy up here, probably 25 to 30 miles an hour. At one point, the wind was so strong that it blew John's hard hat right off his head. The wind just pushed the fire closer and closer to the Sunny Slope neighborhood. We told each house, if you went, as soon as you see fire on that ridge, flames on the ridge, you need to leave. Because and, how much time would they have then? Uh, five, ten minutes, oh. you know. Um, it was about how much time from to get to the top of that ridge down and up here. Five to ten minutes. That's all the warning some people get. 
not a lot of room for error when the stakes are this high. John Kelly and all the crew members that night were hard at work rolling out homeowners' garden hoses to wet things down. They threw wicker furniture off of porches because if an ember landed on that furniture, they could catch the entire house on fire. There's some houses we we actually went in and cut arbovitas out and and cleared them out of there Mm. and and removed fuels, tried to remove debris around decks, things like that. House to house, removing problematic bushes and anything that could potentially draw fire close to a home. For hours, they went on like this. The crews worked from 6.30 that night, worked hard until noon the next day, some till 4 the next day. So, and it was, there's no breaks other than when you're standing here in awe. And at night, it's kind of an interesting thing to see because it looks like this whole thing is orange lights all over it, you know, but it's fire. John says that some homeowners just rely on the firefighters to do all the work to protect their property. But it is really a shared responsibility between firefighters and the community. There are a lot of things people can do to reduce the chance a fire will consume their home. So you see this home has lots of rock placed around it. Um, Especially if you look around this side, there's probably either green grass or rock right up to the siding. The trees, um, you're deciduous. You're not seeing like your juniper and your arborvita hedges, you know, that we see down here that are all burnt out. Coniferous trees like your pines, you know, they're much more receptive to fire than something like a maple or an aspen tree, right? So right, we're looking at a house here with burnt trees and across the street. You're looking at trees that are still green and healthy. Yeah. Um, so that you can see the contrast on the ground. John tells me the house with the green, healthy landscaping did a lot of things right. A 10-foot wide section of rocks border their property to act as a barrier, and the types of plants they have are not ones that easily burn. This is what John means by shared responsibility. Homeowners need to start taking seriously what materials they choose to build their homes with, using cement boards, stucco siding, metal roofing, and other non-combustible materials. What I'm hearing is so much of the firefighting actually happens well before this fire is lit, right? That's a dollar of prevention is worth a thousand dollars of suppression, right? Um, in, and it's the actions that we take long years ahead of the coming fire that make a difference in our suppression outcomes. It took firefighters from several local and state agencies a full seven days to suppress the Red Apple Fire. During that time, the wildfire threatened more than 250 homes. Many of the homes were evacuated. But in the end, not a single home was lost. Home prep definitely, I think, is the, the for me, the take home here. And, you know, I really... I I am amazed that we didn't lose any structures here. It's just, it blows me away. Just the exposure that was here on these 250 plus homes is unreal. And so hats off to the the community and, and, and John and the fire department. For John Riley, there are some clear takeaways from his experience with the Red Apple Fire. There are more and more people moving to our region. We are building on steeper, less accessible terrain. And the part that hits home is that people need to be more thoughtful about how they build and what they plant because the problem of wildfires isn't going anywhere. And there are more of them. They are burning more aggressively through environments that you know, they weren't on the landscape 10, 15 years ago because the built environment wasn't here. So we're facing a new complexity of challenges when it comes to fighting fire in an environment like this. I wonder if people on the west side of the state, I know people on the west side of the state aren't as familiar with the landscaping that they should be thinking about. Uh, Should people west of your county be concerned about this? Absolutely. Um, You know, I'm just a firefighter. What do I know? But, you know, I look as a kid growing up thinking fires are in Southern California. And then as I went, you know, high school, I'm thinking fires are in Northern California. And now you look at Fires are in, on the Oregon coast. Um, fires are in British Columbia, Alaska. And it is, in my opinion, as a firefighter and, and living 37 years on this earth and watching it happen, it is a matter of time before fires are in western Washington. Large-scale fires that we're unprepared for. The reality is, 
the future of wildfires in western Washington is already here. One year ago, Labor Day 2020, a large-scale wildfire ripped through Pierce County. The Sumner Grade Fire traveled along State Route 410 near Bonnie Lake, burning almost 500 acres and destroying two homes. And for two weeks last month, 40% of the active wildfires this season were happening on the west side of the Cascades. Thanks for listening today. You can see photos of the homes John and Kelly protected on our Instagram page. We're at Seattle Now Pod. Today's show was written and produced by Matt Martin and edited by Jeannie Yandel. Our production team is Caroline Chamberlain Gomez, Diana O'Pong, Jenny Cecil Moore, Claire McGrain, and Jason Pagano. Matt Jorgensen does our theme music. I'm Paige Browning. See you tomorrow. <laughs>